Thanks, and uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, so it's been a couple of years since uh, we did a presentation last, and we do have a couple of interesting updates. Uh, so on the next slide, we're gonna talk about the what we're gonna be covering. Uh, so we're gonna start off with what the current state of IPv6 is, uh, and what we're seeing from a health trends perspective for net traversal. Uh, and when we talk about uh, some of the challenges we're facing with net traversal with IPv4, uh, there's a couple different ways that we've actually uh, been mitigating some of the net traversal issues uh, that we'll talk about for uh, multiplayer and uh, game chat. Uh, and then uh, we also want to talk about some of the challenges that we've been facing when actually trying to run multiplayer gaming in chat over IPv6. So next slide. Uh, next slide. And so uh, a couple of years ago when uh, we last presented, uh, we did cover uh, that IPv6 has been supported on Xbox One since the launch. Uh, it's been primarily used for content downloads, uh, services, and apps. Uh, app streaming over IPv6 has been <clears throat> a big pusher of traffic on operator networks, uh, as well as uh, 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 content downloads for games uh, and game updates. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've actually enabled IPv6 support for both party chat and multiplayer. Uh, party chat is a popular feature that allows you to uh, party up with a group of friends to chat within or across games. Uh, and we've continued to see year over year growth for IPv6. Uh, as you can see in the chart below, uh, this is consoles that uh, run multiplayer games and the percent of those consoles that are actually connected with IPv6 internet access. Uh, so next slide. So uh, what's been driving the IPv6 adoption rate uh, has been, of course, uh, more ISPs continually rolling out IPv6 support across their networks. Uh, but some of the challenges that we also see that uh, have prevented that growing any further is that there are still a lot of popular retail routers that are uh, shipped with IPv6 disabled by default. Uh, we actually made a change within the Xbox UI uh, a little over a year ago to help kind of nudge customers into uh, checking to see if IPv6 is enabled on the network. Uh, so it's a little screenshot from a portion of the Xbox UI and the network settings to inform a customer <clears throat> if they're connected to the internet with just IPv4 or dual stack. Uh, if they only have IPv4 connectivity, uh, we have a friendly page that gives them a little bit of information about IPv6 and support. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, do a, a little bit of a nudge without uh, alarmist, you know, we don't want to make them think that they need to call support or call up their ISP unless it's just more of a, hey, you know, is IPv6 available on my network? And if so, how do I turn it on? There's just some of our forums and looking at some of the common uh, devices and how to enable IPv6 if it is indeed turned off by default. Uh, next slide. So uh, talking about uh, NAT health trends for IPv4 uh, on the next slide. Um, so there are many titles that use a client server topology, uh, which is popular, especially for games that have a very large uh, player bases within uh, a, a session. But peer-to-peer -peer is still very popular for many games, including some of the top games uh, that we see on the in the Xbox ecosystem. Uh, Party Chat is also peer-to-peer uh, -peer by default, uh, and so this has been a, a similar uh, uh, similar experience as it has been in previous console generations. We're still using uh, UPnP to communicate with uh, uh, CPE in the home to try to configure uh, the router for optimal net uh, traversal. Uh, and uh, you may or may not be familiar with some of the terminology that we use uh, for uh, informing customers of the NAT type that they have. We, we use the simplified NAT terminology of open, moderate, and strict. And uh, it's very common to see the chart uh, floating around that 
informs customers <clears throat> of what they would typically experience when trying to connect uh, consoles with different NAT types to each other. Uh, and when customers are unable to uh, connect, it's a pretty frustrating experience and it also can be challenging since it's uh, fairly technical walking them through uh, how to do port forwarding or configure their console to be in the DMZ. Uh, and so whenever there are support calls around uh, this type of issue, they tend to be lengthy and costly, whether it's on the ISP or on the Xbox side of trying to walk customers through uh, why they're unable to connect uh, because of IPv4 and ad issues. Uh, next slide. And so because of IPv4 address exhaustion, we are seeing a continued increase in deployments of CGNAT uh, with customers facing double NAT environments, whether the double NAT is within the home or outside of the home. Uh, it can often lead to issues with trying to do peer-to-peer -peer multiplayer and chat over IPv4. Uh, we actually released another update to the Xbox UI that uh, if you are seeing uh, a non-open NAT, and also we detected the presence of a double NAT, we actually inform the customer of that and point them to a, a helpful support page uh, to try to guide them through those steps. And so, you know, clarification that just having a, a double NAT doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to encounter issues. It's just more that uh, it's a common source of uh, non-open NAT types. Um, we work with ISPs, uh, both large and small, with uh, configuration optimization to try to get uh, CGNAT environments to work well with peer-to-peer -peer multiplayer. But this is something that uh, we used to see more relegated to a small uh, and sometimes medium operators. We're now seeing it in the larger operators that are rolling out CGNAT uh, because of V4 address exhaustion. And so uh, we expect that peer-to-peer -peer over IPv4 is going to continue to be increasingly more difficult, uh, which is why we've been focusing on uh, mitigation steps. So next slide. And so uh, we've come up with a couple different ways to bypass IPv4 NAT issues uh, on the next slide. So one of the functionality uh, or feature functionality that we released was actually leveraging um, uh, relays within Azure in order to work around problematic NAT types. And so this works for both uh, party chat as well as uh, we released a uh, new multiplayer API for game developers called Xbox Integrated Multiplayer or Zim. And so the, the con connection flow works so that uh, the consoles behind incompatible NAT types will first attempt to uh, connect directly over IPv4. Uh, if the connection cannot be made, uh, a call is made to an Azure service to allocate a, uh, a VM for relay functionality. And then that VM is used to essentially just bounce packets uh, between the consoles to work around the NAT type since the VM has a, a wide open connection and doesn't have any filtering or uh, problematic NAT behavior in place. And next slide. And the, the second feature that we added was actually enabling uh, IPv6 functionality for multiplayer and party chat. And one thing that uh, I need to clarify when we talk about multiplayer is that this is for the default platform API with an Xbox. Uh, game developers have, uh, some de game developers have used different networking stacks that may or may not support IPv6. And so this isn't to say that every title on Xbox now is IPv6 enabled. It's more of uh, titles that leverage the default platform APIs or Zim uh, have IPv6 functionality enabled. So we are using IPsec for network security. Uh, and along with that, uh, in order for uh, connectivity to work across CPE that has IPv6 firewalls in place, it does need to follow the guidance of C60, especially don't filter inbound IPv6 uh, IC or ESP packets. Uh, when we try to connect in a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology, uh, we will try both IPv4 and IPv6. 
uh, we actually start the IPv6 connection process first and then very shortly after start the IPv4 flow. Uh, whichever path connects first is the connection that we'll use. We want the lower latency connection, and so it's a pretty uh, simple, uh, whichever path has the fastest connection metric is the one that we're going to use. Uh, and if we can't connect over IPv6 or IPv4 in a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology, uh, we still have the fallback logic of calling out to Azure to use a relay server to work around the NAT issues. And next slide. And one more slide. So this uh, is a good graphic to kind of illustrate the challenges that we have when we're actually trying to connect uh, devices in a peer-to-peer -to -peer topology over IPv6. Um, so of course you've got, you know, you're starting from your all devices that uh, are using peer-to-peer -to -peer topology for, let's use party chat for this instance. And so from there, uh, we have the number of devices, just the, the first device connecting that has IPv6 access uh, and then the next filtering layer is that both devices need to have IPv6 internet access. And then the next layer of filtering is that both sites need to have compatible IPv6 firewall types. And then finally, uh, that the IPv6 uh, path needs to have uh, equal or lesser uh, the latency than IPv4. Um, you know, we always talk about the, uh, the familiar chant of the developers, developers, developers. For us, it's more about latency, latency, latency. Um, so going back to uh, working around NAT types uh, and uh, IPv4 connection issues, uh, for relay functionality, we're right around probably uh, plus or minus about 10% of our party chat uh, sessions are actually run via relay servers to get around NAT issues. Uh, and then when we talk about uh, IPv6 paths, uh, even though we are approaching about 50% of our uh, console population having IPv6 connectivity, we're actually only running about five, four to five percent of connections are actually running over IPv6 because of uh, all of the filtering effects that you see in this slide. And so uh, I prefer to do things more in a, in a Q&A format. So this was kind of a tee up of uh, where we're currently at. Uh, the functionality that we have uh, within Xbox and, and the challenges that we're seeing and ways that we're working around it. So I don't know if we uh, have a way of doing a Q&A or if there are any questions in the room. Yeah, so we've been using UP... Uh, sorry, lower the volume here. So we've been using UPnP for a number of years now, and, and uh, I understand and agree with that it's not the, the best... Uh, best utility from a security standpoint that there's no authentication. Uh, I won't get into the, you know, there's something to be said for if you're within the internal network and use that as a way of configuring the NAT, you've got bigger issues already that someone's penetrated the local network. Um, in an ideal world, we'll be moving more and more traffic to IPv6 and uh, routers will be following the guidance of the RFC to allow uh, mutually authenticated and secure traffic via IPsec to traverse the NAT. Uh, but in the meantime, um, there are a couple different ways of, you know, if we did, you know, UPnP is not required out of the gate, but at the same time, you need to have a compatible NAT type. And so probably the the way to strike the balance between uh, security concerns and customer uh, ease of use uh, is to allow the NAT to work as an address restricted NAT. And so you are still filtering inbound packets, but an address restricted NAT still is classified as an open NAT type. And so that allows multiplayer functionality to work uh, easily without any UPnP required, and so that would probably be the easiest way to try to stack the balance between security and customer ease of use. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we don't have any plans currently to enforce uh, titles uh, using IPv6. It's not usually the best way to work with developers is to uh, add more restrictions or requirements to them. It's more natural that uh, they add functionality 
uh, as its necessity, uh, as a necessity based off of what customer requirements are. And that's, we found the easiest way to do it is to make it completely uh, hands off for them. And so that's one of the things that we did with the platform API is that uh, IP addressing is actually abstracted away from the developer. They used uh, a construct that underneath it, we've built both IPv4 and IPv6 addressing automatically. And so uh, to them using the platform APIs, uh, they're not aware that they're using a relay server. They're not aware that they're using v4 versus v6. And honestly, that's the best way to get game adoption uh, for using IPv6 is to make it so that it's not any extra steps on, on the part of the developer. Uh, for titles that use their own platform APIs uh, that are using peer-to-peer, -peer, I expect that uh, as NAT traversal becomes more challenging because of v4 address exhaustion, that you'll see more adoption for v6. And then for uh, games that use a client-server topology, uh, just the fact that uh, there's no more addresses to be had and we have to optimize for the addresses that we do have that it's, that's a natural pressure for developers to enable v6 for server-based games uh, to try to optimize the use of the limited pool that they have available. Uh, we do, we're actually trying to uh, augment our uh, strength there with adding some more telemetry and also adding some more customer visible data. Uh, we actually have found more challenges with IPv6 when it comes to in-home networking. Uh, it's been a little bit, but we did a study across a large number of uh, devices that supported IPv6 and found that uh, it wasn't uncommon to encounter uh, routers, uh, both in the home and then also networks where uh, IPv6 latency was actually higher than v4 uh, due to different optimizations. Um, one of the things that we need to invest in more is actually providing uh, customer visibility into uh, what does your IPv6 uh, firewall type look like? Uh, actually do some outside-in connection tests to let people know that uh, either Ike and or ESP packets are being filtered uh, to understand that uh, my connectivity to game servers has uh, latency uh, of X for V4 and latency of Y for V6. Uh, and ultimately, uh, gamers are very latency sensitive and so uh, it can actually be viewed as a competitive advantage for uh, network operators that have high quality, low latency V6 connectivity. Um, it's not uncommon for in the V4 world to have gamers uh, compare their latency with friends and say, oh, my friend on this network is, you know, 20 milliseconds uh, less latency than I have, uh, you know, start considering possibly moving operators because of challenges that they have with multiplayer gaming because of latency.